Okay, Tim, so first of all, I was going to ask you is you're coming to yoga from a massive period of dance background. What can you, what do you draw from that into the yoga and, and vice versa? How can you translate? So dance practitioners that have also taken up yoga for, for, for gaining something to then transport back into their dance. How do you see the two interrelated? Well, the first thing that comes to mind is what I bring from dance into yoga is a bunch of injuries. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but on a little bit more serious note, uh, I think if you have uh, worked with dance or sports before, then you have cultivated a certain um, state of mind, a certain uh, uh, practice state of mind where you are willing to put in the discipline. There's a certain... Uh, uh, acceptance of uh, doing what it takes. Um, so first of all that I would say. Uh, with dance, you know, obviously we have, we work a lot with flexibility yeah. um, and strength at the same time. There's some things which uh, can be counterproductive, which, uh, for instance, in dance we often use our hip joints to uh, carry our weight for stability, okay. where in yoga most of the time we use the hip joint uh, as a flexibility joint. Yeah. So for me personally, that has taken me some time to get my whole um, side pelvis there to uh, to pivot in another direction. All that musculature and fascia was quite tight. Do you find there was more strength involved in the, the dance or more strength involved in the yoga? Well, depends a little bit. Uh, a lot of strength in dance, uh, of course, but also a lot of flexibility. And the same thing in, in yoga, depending on which series you're doing, like th there's more and more strength, there's more and more demands on both strength and flexibility, the further you, the more you practice, the more advanced practice that you do. And going back the other way, so, so I've spoken to a few dancers that have said that the whole way that they used their body in in dance mm. was different to the way they then start, ah, okay, mm. now I can see the connections in the yoga, whereas before mm. I was just like doing stuff, yeah, uh, creating these shapes without mm. necessarily looking after my body. Yeah, I, I think when you, when you work with dance, the ultimate um, uh, thing that you're after is to express express through form yeah so it's very very easy to get form based and if you have a traditional training as a dancer you spend way more time than anyone enjoys in very tight clothes in front of a mirror so that uh, slowly impregnates you with uh, trying to shape up yeah does that make sense yeah and um, <clears throat> also dance uh, traditionally is taught, especially classical ballet, which is not, which was not my uh, forte. I was working in modern dance, and contemporary, contemporary, contemporary dance, dance oh. modern dance. Um, it is taught very old school, so it's, it's uh, there's not a lot of um, uh, modern pedagogics involved there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. If I should say it mildly, um, so you can get very. Uh, harsh on yourself because you have been treated very harshly yeah. for a number of years so a certain uh, masochism like tends to develop a little bit you know that you have a, uh, a view on yourself that you're never quite good enough you know yeah. and which is a good thing if you can just turn it over just one one inch to the left you can come to a place where there's always something else you can do you know so you wouldn't you have a built-in humbleness about even when you excel, if that happens. Um, so that would be the positive side of that. And was there anything that you brought from dance that gave you an insight into some postures that would normally maybe say present problems, difficulties in getting your head around or physically? Yeah. Balance, balance postures, balance postures yeah. for instance, like we spend a lot of time in dance balancing. Yeah. So that, how to use the foot, how to use the knee, <coughs> which muscles in your leg and in your pelvis to use. We have a notion that's called being on top of your leg okay. in dance. And if you're not on top of your legs, your spine and your pelvis can't really function. You cannot lift the other leg up very well. You cannot balance very well. And um, 
So if you're on top of your leg, which basically means that you place your pelvis on top of your, your femur bone, your acetabulum yeah. on top of your, your femur, if you place that well there, well supported, then you have a better chance of, of balancing. So how, so how would we go balance. about that if, say, we're doing Uttita Haspadanga Stasana? Mm -hmm. where, where, what would we start with? How would we ground that and become balanced on up? Well, the first thing we would do is like we need to transfer weight from two feet to one foot. Yeah. So that means a slight uh, transfer of weight towards that foot. So now the 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 feet are not placed under your sit bones yeah. or your your hip joints anymore. Now you're transferring over to one foot. So now that one foot is placed right in between your two. Uh, sit bones between your your two hip joints. So that creating like a center line. Yes. Yeah. So what that means is, and you can do that two ways. We can pivot over from the top. Yeah. Or we can move our pelvis slightly to the side, which is, um, which would pivot the, which would mean that the spine is still straight. Yes. And you are just basically from the bottom of your pelvis from your trochanter, major, yeah. the major trochanter, you're pivoting that slightly over to the side, which creates a slight rotation in the hip joint and gives you better possibility to balance there. So you're basically almost just translating the pelvis across in space it, rather yes. than any tipping or... Exactly. Yeah. And there's a minute um, movements in all the joints, in the spine and in the knee joint, in the uh, the ankle joint that is taking place at the same time and it means that you keep uh, involving the inside of your legs rather than pivoting to the outside yeah. of your legs. And what those people Does that, that tend sense? to sort of collapse a little bit on the, particularly if you, you tend to over pronate already so that mm -hmm. inside ankle wants to collapse just when you're walking mm -hmm. around. Yeah. Then when they do things I've noticed like Uchita Hasta when they're on one leg that same tendency of wanting to collapse on the inside mm -hmm. seems to happen. What, are the, what needs to go through their mind in order to draw that back up and create that stability? Because all the time you're falling in, you're... Well, I think you're saying it, you're like mm. drawing back up and creating stability. And usually what happens when we collapse is that there's a lack of stability, there's a lack of, uh, of activating the foot. And the only way to get that stability is by creating some kind of conscious activation in the foot. Uh, there's a notion called a short foot. Mm. I'm not even sure if that's from dance, where you kind of pull your, uh, your the ball of your big toe towards your heel, and you heel a little bit towards your big toe, so you shorten a little bit there, which brings your increasing the arch. Yes, which mm. increases the arch uh, a slight bit, and which also tends to widen the front foot and widen the toes a little bit. Um, and then again, of course, pushing down the, the big toe and the little toe, so you create the, the arch in the front foot also. Yeah. Um, but these are all these are all very technical, right? Like That's good. So things like that. I think <laughs> like generally, like we forget sometimes in yoga that it's not the art of flexibility, yeah. but that it is really the art of balancing uh, strength and flexibility in the in a measured and appropriate uh, amount, um, and that just trying to be natural doesn't cut it at all yeah we fall into the same mistakes a lot don't we yeah, yeah like the whole notion of natural is built on an idea that we know what natural is mm. and the whole idea of yoga is that we have lost what is natural and we need to reclaim that through um, awareness consciousness and um, effort that we set in with conscious effort and awareness wherever nature is lost and we go to a teacher to figure out what is nature and what is not nature. <laughs> <laughs> if we stick with Utita Hasta just for a sec and mm -hmm. we're thinking okay now we're, we're in uh, A and we want to do B and we want to take the leg out to the side mm -hmm. and now we also want to turn our head to the side, mm -hmm. the opposite side that throws a lot of people out, doesn't yeah. it? That just the movement of the head to the side. Yeah. And I imagine that focus thing is again something that yeah. dancers are using there. They're spinning around. They're they're yeah. using their eyes, their head a lot. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So is what there any? There? Yeah. What to do? Well, first of all, it's the same movement we just talked about with like uh, slightly moving the pelvis, allowing the pelvis to move to the side rather than the shoulders. Yeah. First of all. So you can maintain a straight spine, which goes very well with the whole idea of the 
energy rising and the kundalini and the shakti and the shushumna and all that not to start to kink the spine in different directions but keep that clean pure and straight um, so when we start to move our leg out to the side we of course have a whole other amount of weight that we need to counter with the hips so there one more time by starting to move weight out there we need to counter that with the with the hip moving Traveling to the, the other side direction, yeah. which sometimes means that we end up standing a little bit like that with the with the hip pointing that way yeah. and then the the spine coming up straight of that does that make sense yeah um now in terms of how to use the gaze to balance uh, the more we look up the harder it generally is to 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 balance a gaze that goes a little bit down seems to be a more natural kinesthetic help for balancing so if you want to balance first of all take a um, a gazing point that is that can be three four five meters away from you or ten meters away from yeah. you it's not so important but below the horizon from however high you, you are, are yeah. and then make the movement first keep that point then when you have completed the, the movement and you now are in uh, uh, stability again staticness again then you move your head yeah and you can do two ways you can leave this focus and take that focus or you can slide your focus all along depending on what works well for you now same thing when you come back you have two possibilities either first you move your gaze and then you move your yeah. leg or first you move your leg and then you move your gaze any but one easier than the other no try it out see which one you prefer i think it would be a matter of taste more i, I tend to do one or the other yeah. and uh, play around with them a little bit yeah. cool um with swap tech and i wanted to ask you about um deep back bends mm -hmm. first of all um <clears throat> what do you see as the benefits of these deeper back bends so we're saying not necessarily urdhva maybe kapatasanas maybe maybe the advanced uh, back bends energetically physically how do you see what are the benefits from those postures? how do they work into yeah. this yoga thing well first of all um i th oh, there's so many levels i think they are absolutely significant um, and if you go to mysore these days in the last 20 years has been put a lot of emphasis on back bending yeah and i don't know I th as my understanding is that before that time there was a little bit less emphasis on it why i don't know but um let's see from uh i think it very much ties into energetic mental and emotional and that the whole physicality of it is maybe a little bit um less important well, i'm not sure i agree with myself there but something like that <laughs> but um as soon as we start to go backwards we hit a mental and emotional wall there's fear instantly it means that now we have to drop back into the unknown um you know on a metaphysical level we kind of move into the past and that is all very scary for us we like to move forward we like to have tunnel vision we like to have goals and goals are always ahead of us very rarely yeah. do we have a goal that's behind us like i would like to be who i was three years ago that doesn't happen unless so we're about much. 89 and then we like we want to move the clock back. Ex exactly like maybe like oh i just turned 47 i would like to be 23 again but yeah. um that's right but i think that uh, so that's one big fear factor so you start to move into this <clears throat> to this place where fear becomes very uh, apparent and fear is a great catalyst for learning something about ourselves to move for moving towards a deeper knowledge of what exists within us when we are uh, faced with the problem of fear then we can see how our mind works what comes up for us and how we react now when we start to have those um, mechanism out in the open then we can evaluate whether we are functioning well or not well so now we have a bunch of uh, uh, stuff that we can work with on a mental plane on a physical plane and so forth does that make any sense yeah. 
So that'll be that'll be one. Second, um, in relation to the fear, we are going into the the central nervous system, and if we look at it from the Western point of view, the central nervous system is pretty much responsible for anything physical in in the body and at least the nervous system is responsible for how our muscles react and how our organs react and how our um, back bends and so forth. So when we start to go deep into the, um, uh, to the backbone, to the, uh, to the vertebral column, to the central nervous system, we have the possibility, again on a mental, emotional plane, to see what comes up and on a more energetic and maybe physical plane we can start to clean out some of the uh, responses that we are not really interested in and my understanding is that that is what is meant with nadi shodhana with the uh, nadi means the energy uh, channel yeah and the, and shodhana means purification uh, clean out so what we're trying to do is like that uh, channel that is um, which is very often um, uh, the Sushumna channel here in the middle of the spinal column yeah. is often compared to the central nervous system so if you want to do Nadi Shodhana on the Sushumna channel then that is very um, close to cleaning out your central nervous system for uh, inefficient uh, nervous responses. So like a cleansing a cleansing of that center channel? Exactly. Uh, yeah. And I think that it's very... Uh, I, I feel that when I backbend. And... Um, you, you were saying to me about an experience recently in Mysore with a, a deep backbend. Can you share yeah. that with us? Yes, I was in Mysore uh, a month ago <clears throat> and uh, Sharat took me very deep into uh, my backbend one day and um, deeper than I have been before. And I felt that uh, one of the places that I personally have uh, some stuckness is in my pelvis. And I felt that it was like a deep sheet of fascia in my pelvis, along with my iliosaurus, started to stretch open really deeply for the first time. And at first it was little scary and without me uh, realizing it I was kind of like like really jacked up in yeah. my whole nervous response because of that and Sherat said to me Tim no he doesn't call me Tim he calls me <laughs> Dim <laughs> Dim relax and I realized that I was all jacked up like that and I, because I trust him I completely relaxed and then there was this amazing sensation that was just flowing in and for a moment I moved into a little timeless space, like, is that called Samadhi? You know, who knows, right? But some like, just like a, for a moment of, from fear to calm, to pleasure, to timeless, to pleasure, to realizing that whole process and then coming out of it again. Um, And whatever that is, that was very meaningful to me on, on many levels. I was just thinking that's one, like on a physical level, I think yeah. why backbending is, is uh, significant. Yeah. Backbending has great impact on the digestive system, the whole um, upper and middle and lower abdomen, abdomen which again has great uh, influence on the whole reproductive um, abdomen. So. Uh, if we can start to clean out a little bit in the uh, uh, digestive system there, then everything else functions much better in the whole body and we are less likely to get physical disease. We're getting what we need. Yeah, we get some energizing in there and uh, we're less likely to get colon cancer and prostate cancer and uh, problems with um, uh, the reproductive organs. And if we if we so stick with these backbends, I know it's something that you spend quite a bit of time with with the women workshops that you do. Mm -hmm. What are your guidelines for safely accessing some of these deeper backbends? 
is there a process, a mental process you need to go through, or a, yeah. a, almost a checklist? Yeah, um, I had a herniated disc a couple of years ago from pursuing uh, backbending too strongly, too vehemently for a while, combined with the precon precondition uh, and a couple of other things. But um, so I had went through this whole process where I came to a place where I finally where I could not move. I literally couldn't move. And slowly I realized to make this story short, I slowly realized that the only way that I could move was to uh, engage very, very strong the musculature in my pelvis. Yeah. And I did that for a while. And then I realized I was in Mysore at the time. Uh, and I couldn't move. It was really uh, playing a lot of games with my mind, you know. So, and uh, suddenly I realized that Guruji, for years, had been saying to me and other other people around me in the yoga shala, uh, had be say, uh, would be saying things like, "You take it, your anus," meaning squeeze your anus. Yeah. And I was like, "Wait a minute! This is what I'm doing now. I'm squeezing my anus. I'm also squeezing other stuff. But this is." When I take this engagement with this muscular activation, then I can move. Let me see if what Guruji says with only the anus instead of all this other stuff I'm yeah. activating, if that cuts it. So I started to narrow my muscular engagement down to only the anus um, and found that that worked just as well and maybe even better. And then I figured out that that squeezing the anus is equal to the pelvic floor, yeah. about engaging the pelvic floor. And the more I looked into what the engagement of the pelvic floor meant physically, then I could move more and more and I could start to move myself back in my practice and actually do something that slightly resembled the Ashtanga yoga practice. Yeah, right. And uh, the more I got into that, uh, greatly aided by a uh, a close friend and a good colleague uh, who both are uh, w uh, serious practitioners of the Pilates technique, yes. Joseph Pilates technique. Um, slowly I realized what they are talking about is very, very close to my understanding of Mula Bandha is and what I read about Mula Bandha and what Guruji used to say about Mula Bandha, which wasn't much, and what other uh, influential teachers have told me about Mula Bandha. And suddenly I realized that the pelvic floor and the mula bandha and the way that they interact um, is what could what recreated the stability in that region for me where there was too much movement that's is pretty much the condition of a herniated disc it's moving too much so i could create stability around that joint again about my lumbar vertebra number three and four yeah to uh, to do gentle back bends, to jump forward, to jump back, to forward bend, to twist, and so forward, and 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 little by little, uh, I was able to go back to a full practice. But it, as we spoke about before, as I mentioned before, it uh, it was very much about me taking a physical engagement, a conscious physical activation of effort. And I needed to do that for years until I slowly now have come to a place where I can let it go again. I can start to work mobility into the area, which is what I'm trying to do at the moment. And so learning those lessons you learned from that injury. Yes. How does that affect now how you teach people to do backbends? Oh, I teach uh, backbend not from relaxation. I teach it from engagement. Okay. I teach it from activation. And the key is the pelvic floor. And what I experienced in my own body and what I experienced with many people that I have been teaching is that as soon as they get their hands on, on activating the pelvic floor, then there's no pain in backbending. And I like to think about it in a very simple formula. You have two possibilities. You can activate or you can have pain. Right. And it's really your choice. Like there you can, you can apply effort or you can be in pain. It's your choice. How do you want to back So, So what are the cues for people that, because I know like a lot of us have trouble getting that activation mm -hmm. and then keeping it or yeah. even yeah. realizing we've got it in the first place. Yeah. 
So have you got any cues, tips for us on along those lines? Yeah, that's uh, going to be the $5,000 advanced <laughs> workshop. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, y yeah, you know, I find that it's a, it's a slow process. And to say that pelvic floor activation is Mula Bandha would not be correct. But pelvic floor activation is the first step towards finding um, Mula Bandha uh, and that whole mystical notion. Um, but learning to first localizing, uh, let me just go one step back here, identifying what uh, activating the pelvic floor is, localizing and being able to come back to it and then being able to maintain it in all kind of movements when the mind has to be preoccupied with other stuff at the same time still keeping that focus in your pelvic floor and taking that into a back bend or whatever you want to do that is uh, what is essential guruji he used to teach it very simple he said you take it your anus he said you squeeze your anus and uh, he said specifically the anus because the anus is located in the two muscles that uh, run from the front of the pelvis to the back of the pelvis, from the pubic bone to the coccyx. And if you squeeze your anus, you squeeze these two muscles, the pubeococcygeal muscles. And nobody know what the pubeococcygeal muscles are, but everybody know what the anus yeah. is. So if we can talk about it in lay terms that we all know, then it's, it's much easier to understand, of course. The problem is that often when we start to squeeze the 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 anus we also start to squeeze the thighs yeah. the abdominals you know the neck the yeah. teeth you know <laughs> eyeballs you know stuff like that. so it takes a little bit of time to learn to separate that it's a very small strong precise action so it's slow is it slow worth, process is it, is it worth taking the that as a separate exercise and just doing some exercises doing to that. to gain your awareness I think well, it's necessary yeah. if you want to catch it because the fa the process the sorry the practice is complex and I often um, after teaching this and set, setting it up really really slow I ask the, my students to start to move a little bit and as soon as they start to lift one arm up yeah. the anus goes yeah. and as soon as we start to do a Surya Namaskara the anus goes and and when we get better then we can keep it there together but yeah uh, to take up a practice is very good for that uh, at that time I was doing pranayama every day I for about 10 years I was doing pranayama every day with kumbhakas with yes with retentions and without proposing anyone to start a pranayama practice up without uh, proper guidance uh, the kumbhagas the retentions in pranayama is probably the best way to learn about your pelvic floor because when you are in trouble with retaining your breath yeah. then all the only go-to place at least for me that I had would be my pelvic floor uh, Tim Miller, Big Tim, he says um, that Mula Banda and fear cannot coexist. So when you are in the retaining moment and you start to really want to <laughs> take a breath, really want to breathe out or breathe in, when the mind starts to go a little bit bananas and you start to go, the primal nervous system starts to have fear of death. Yes. Then that is the moment that you need some place to hang on to. And um, his experience there about Mula Banda and fear not being able to coexist, I have, I have the same uh, experience. Same there. sensation. You gotta go there. So, if we can, if we can stick with the same backbend theme for the moment, mm -hmm. uh, and a couple of questions on those lines. Um, First of all, Daniel Asana, mm -hmm. um, where should we be putting, first of all, how do you teach it? With the, the knees and feet together or knees and feet hip width and with the foi, feet, foi, feet, foi, <laughs> feet pointed or with them um, flexed? Well, first we'd learn the form. Right. So first time we 
when someone is ready to get uh, the next asana and that is downward asana then <clears throat> the first thing is you know, get your feet up you know hold on to your ankles three five times and then when we start to get a little bit more comfortable with that notion and lying there in this god awful helpless uh, <laughs> Uh, it's like a hog tied position. Yeah, I it's think, a little isn't bit, it? isn't yeah. it? Like, a, it's like what do they call it? The police has like they call like the knee lock or something yeah, like yeah. that, right? So yeah, <laughs> that's the one. Yeah. It's a yogic version of the knee lock. So, <clears throat> um, so I think uh, when we start to get a little bit more accustomed to it, then we move the knees closer together. Yeah. And the the toes together and the heels together. So in that order, uh, toes together, uh, heels together and knees together. Now how together that's a really good question and I think it depends on uh, what you're after. If you have a student that is a little bit on, on the side where discomfort is a major hurdle then you ask them to do everything so yeah. they can start to work with discomfort. Now, if you have someone that is not troubled by discomfort then you can you have a little bit more range to play there. And in my opinion, the knees doesn't need to touch. In like, they more need to be in the uh, the, the distance, uh, the same distance as your hip joint. So following basically. a line from the hip all the way down. Pretty yeah. much, yeah. Maybe a little bit more together mm. uh, than that in in Dhanurasana. Would you say it's more important to have the hips, knees, and feet in line than one or the other? Yeah. You know, feet in but then the knees depends out. Depends right? a little bit on the level of the practitioner and how tight the, uh, the iliosaurus yeah. is for this uh, student and uh, some of the other muscles. Uh, in my opinion it's more important to have the, the legs high than the chest high. Okay. And what I usually start out with is to, to ask for the lower ribs yes. to be planted on the ground and the pubic bone pretty much to be planted on the ground and then creating space in the abdomen between these two and then lifting up the abdomen like in a hollow effect, yeah. domi kind of effect, it's a Uriana Banda effect. Uh, if you do this, um, if you do not do this, if you push your belly out, it is impossible to have the pelvic floor uh, activated. So if you can lift up the into a kind of Uddiyana Bandha, it's more likely that your pelvic floor will kick in. Yeah. And then lift the, the feet up as, as much as you can towards the ceiling and lift the knees up as much as you can. So you can start to open the whole front here also which you need in a second for Kapotasana. And how do you send that focus to the rear instead of the front with the... You, you push your ankles into your hands and you reach your toes up to the, to the ceiling. So it's a very hard pose actually. And Especially the feet, are me. they pointing to the <laughs> ceiling or are they... Are they pointed to the ceiling. Pointed to the yes. ceiling. But I think when you catch your feet, when you catch your ankle, flex yeah. your feet because yeah. then you can figure out exactly where to grab. Then so you get you're getting really, some balance. Yeah. You get a really Symmetry. good handle there. Yeah. So you're not catching your feet, you're catching your ankles. Yeah. And so you have the possibility to move your feet. Yeah. Then when you have found that place and you catch right down there, then you point your Then you point straight and, up. and lift that. Yeah. Cool. There's some interesting connection between pointing the, f the foot and the toes and the activation of the sole of the feet which kind of tends to um, engage a little bit into the pelvic floor. That's okay. a kind of like, I don't some even know. Some mystic continuum there. Yeah, some uh, secret nadi <laughs> or something. That is uh, go with that. into that. So okay. Uh, give it a try, you can feel it yeah. easily. So. so if we take a step from that and then we go into <clears throat> pars with Daniel Asana, mm -hmm. some people find it much easier to roll one way than the other or even impossible to roll one way when they so yeah any ideas why that's happening and have you been able to fix that in, in people it's been if a little while since I learned that posture and having what I think is like when we the first thing that we ask to do is to inhale and, and lift up yeah. so already there we start to have a a curve like a, a bow pose yeah. in our in the front body so if we lie down pretty flat, then there's a lot of surface, it's really hard to so it's trying it to roll over. a log, isn't it? Yeah, or a, 
or a table, <laughs> I would say, right? Yeah. So you want to try to, to lift your ends, uh, both ends of your body up so you have as little surface as possible. So you, uh, you are lifting up to about your lower abdomen and your pubic bone. Now you are on a now you on a, on a on a more um, round surface. Yeah. Then you can pivot over to the side more easy. And for me personally, it works better to initiate the the rollover from my lower body, from my pelvis and my feet, than from my shoulders and my chest. Okay. So from Does that, that makes sense. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I think that's one thing I brought with me from dance very much. That is. A principle uh, that's called movement initiation that we call movement initiation is like and it basically means from where does the movement start uh, taking into account acknowledging that every movement is a is a chain reaction is an yeah. is a series of events that unrolls and if any movement has a particular source where it will uh, start from and if you do not have this source then your projection will be inefficient and you will have to use more energy to complete the movement or you won't be able to do the movement at all so um, that i work with all the time every time i learn something new and i constantly evaluate uh, what is my initiation of this movement and have you got that same sense of Uriyana when you're that you were using in Danyarasana as you're lifting up to roll see yeah on a little bit lighter you know these Uriyana Bandha and Mula Bandha is is dynamic yeah. uh, activities right like on a muscular and on an uh, energetic level so you I will use them more or less muscular and I will tune more or less into them depending on what I what I do but when I backbend <coughs> uh, as I mentioned before for years I've had to engage very 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 strong because yeah. if not I was instantly in trouble between my third and fourth lumbar verte vertebra yeah. which is now better so then you come over there and then I think here I think it's very important that you drop your knee to the other knee yes and I think again the first thing you do is you come down you take a moment and you relax because what I see most people do is they go into this new place and instantly they want to try to fully engage and usually in 90% of the times it, it comes across to me as an over engagement so it becomes more of a lockdown yeah and if we can just take maybe out of these five breaths take the first inhale and exhale just to get comfy right there just like ease you know then we can start to think and create and apply um, intelligent discerning mind for a moment without doing much and then from there starting to decide where am I going to set in which is again about movement initiation do I need to lift my head up as the first thing do I need because it fell on the floor do I need to readjust the way I'm holding my neck should I like relax that a little bit um, should I start to move my feet back should I drop my knee down should I relax my shoulders should I just for a moment think about my breath and try to get deep breathing back into yeah. this that would be the very first step um, but then say now you like moving in to the posture then drop that top knee down and what I find is on the first side it gives me a possibility to stretch um, give an extra stretch on that upper side yeah. of the, the pelvis on each side yes because you yeah so let's see we go left side we go over here first so first i can have the possibility to stretch my the the left inside of my ilium yeah. of my uh, uh, whole pelvic uh, bone yeah. there and then i gotta hike up a little bit again to become round to get back up um, into dhanurasana yeah. again there initiating from my lower body rather than my upper body and then pivot on over to the side and then slowly lowering down that right knee and getting into the inside of, of the of the pelvis uh, again uh, i find that that's what pasvadhanarasana gives me personally but it might just be my 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 pattern yeah you know like where i'm tight 
And yeah. what's what's the head doing during all this? When we're on when we're on that side, well, where is it going? You ca I, I like to keep it simple and and keep the the head, the neck, and the spine in one line. Yeah. And then just move it along that line. Just move it back like that. Nice. I I think that's my pr preferred. Now, if that goes very well, feel welcome to look up to the ceiling if, if you want. Yeah. But these days in my soul, it's taught more just like straight back. Straight back. Like that. Old school is when you look up to the ceiling. Yeah. But most of us, when we start to look up to the ceiling, that get all kind Some of crunching comes, doesn't it? Kind yeah. Of cranky stuff. Yeah. And um, I trained uh, in, or I have re received a lot of training in something called Frederick Matthias Alexander's technique, yeah. which takes base in that when you keep your head, your neck and your spine in a functional relationship, then you, you, you don't uh, put the central nervous system under unnecessary stress, which means it's more likely to function well. Yeah. And it can receive the uh, messages that goes in and send the messages that needs to go out to the peripheral nervous system. It can do that in a pure and unobstructed manner which means that the information that is being passed along these lines is going to be accurate instead of inaccurate. So I'm a great fan of, uh, Things in line. of thinking about how the spinal cord comes down and not to mess around with that too much. <laughs> Good. Um, Can I take a sip yeah. maybe of, of this lovely coconut? We have some minutes of slurping. Can I say one more thing before mm. going? Mm. Can I say that <clears throat> this is a fantastic conversation and I really love it. I rarely speak about these things in this detail when I teach. Um, I think this is kind of the nerdy, geeky, uh, uh, personal interest of mine, and in this case also yours. Um, is it necessary to know all this to practice yoga? Absolutely not. It is, yoga is simple. And if we start to practice, then after a while, we start to experience something. And if we reflect on that experience, we have the possibility to find out uh, how we want to pursue that. Uh, and that's all it takes. The experience, allowing ourselves open for the experience and then reflecting on experience. That's all it takes. Can we not uh, reflect in the same way that we are patterned to reflect upon it if we don't consciously like you were saying you have to have a conscious change of how you were in, engaging Mula Banda. Mm -hmm. we can sort of reflect in the same way upon how we're doing something without actually changing it oh yes you were talking about the non-doing well that and just that um, you know yes we can have maybe too much detail and get swamped in the detail of you know should we be thinking about this while we're doing in the posture mm -hmm. but on the other lines if we just do and then we reflect on it but we think because we're coming from the same standpoint and we reflect in the same way we don't ever change things yeah. or we, we maybe that we don't change things I think most Ashtangis, they have this disease called fixing it. Right. You know, every time that we see something is wrong, we try to fix it. Yeah. And it's like an instant. It's not even considered. That there could be a problem with that. Yeah. It is just like something's wrong, boom, fix. And I am a great fan of not fixing in that Go in, take a moment of mindfulness, take a moment of just observing what it is before fixing it. I think the Buddha says it in his Four Noble Truths. He says the way to the suffering is because of our craving. The craving, like how, <clears throat> how to fix our craving or how to deal with our craving is not fixing it. It is to get to know them. So take a moment to get to know them and there's usually more than one solution right there. When there's something that needs to be fixed, personally, my first instance of how to fix anything is usually not the best way of <laughs> fixing it. It's like just the way I'm most used to. Yeah. So if I take a moment and go, something is wrong, I would love to 
to uh, to do something about it, let me just take a moment and just sit with it before I do something about it. Then even sometimes it falls away just by that reflection itself. Yeah. Is that a little bit what you were? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's sure. Okay. <coughs> um, jump throughs, hmm. changing tact. Hmm. That's something I think you cover again. It's something a lot of people have trouble with, particularly hmm. keeping the the tension out of the neck and shoulders. Mm. I, I mean, I've felt both yours and Kino's mm. neck and shoulders, and mm. they're both like super soft. Mm. Yet you do these like really advanced practices. So, mm. how can, what do we need to be thinking about when we're doing this stuff to keep all this sort of from getting tight? Take lots of massages. Yes, of course. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I don't know. Um, that was, of course, a joke, but. Um, uh, <clears throat> it's kind of simple this the sometimes we misunderstand a little bit and uh, in the interpretation in our understanding of what it takes to jump through we think we need to have strong arms yeah and um, actually we need to have a very strong connection of how the arms connects to the shoulders connects into the torso so we need to figure out what uh, makes what integrates the arms really well and that the um, muscular pattern doesn't really sit in the arms, that sits in the upper and mid torso and carries down, of course, to the pelvic floor and the abdominals. So we are after looking for the muscles that sits under the shoulder girdle, and I like to call it the shoulder saddle, mm -hmm. um, which pretty much consists of first and foremost the serratus anterior but that's kind of a little mystical and weird muscle that most people have no idea where it is and even for me i feel it's uh, not the easiest go-to muscle the sensation i get from activating my serratus anterior is very different from the sensation i get from engaging my um, uh, lower abdominals, my transverse yeah. abdominals, something like that. It's a little bit more kind of a foggy feel in general. I mean, that's me personal. But so the serratus anterior, and to make the serratus anterior work properly, we need to engage the rhomboids because the rhomboids uh, creates foundation for the shoulder blades upon yeah. which the serratus anterior attaches, and then back this duo up with the uh, latissimus dorsi so if we have that uh, working then the whole shoulder girdle is down and the arms are now uh, integrated into the torso and then some of the other muscles in the shoulder girdles and in the arms themselves are much more likely to turn on for those people yeah for sure but for those people that that have great difficulty in singling out muscles to activate yeah <laughs> yeah what are the actions going on maybe from the hands up into the shoulders that that maybe uh like one step down for people to work with the prep work for the jump before they actually lift you see here's what i think i think that um most of us, we need to relearn how to use the arms to be able to do this yeah. uh, movement. And it's, it's not a big deal, really. Like, the only thing is what we need to realize is that the way that most of us have been using our arms up till now has been in a pattern and, and requesting something from the function of the arms, which is entirely different from what we want them to do when we jump forward and jump back. We've been asking to carry cappuccino cups, you know, and driving in a car and turning the TV on and yeah. stuff like that. And now suddenly we have to uh, carry the weight of our whole body kind of upside down. Um, and for that, we need to install a new application. And that, m most of the times for many people, we need some specialist to come in, some geek to come in and and install that app yeah. kind of in the system. So taking a workshop on that f for a couple of hours is going to do wonders most of the time. And what about the hips? Where are they aiming to go when we're thinking? Of, sometimes you see people jump through, it comes real, real low. Yeah. And other times it's high and definitely more floaty. 
yeah. feel to it. Now, I'm not a great fan of the coming up to a half handstand before going down. Yeah. And the main problem with it is that it's oh, for many people possible to get up there and it feels kind of fun and woo yeah. up there. Yeah, weightless. But, mm. Yeah, but then from there and coming down and through, it's like a plonk. It's like, <laughs> like it's like throwing a big stone into the water <laughs> kind of thing. So what I think is much more beneficial for 99% of everybody who want to learn to jump through yeah. is not to try to do that, but to jump the knees into the chest and then lower through, either lower down or lower through. Yeah. When we do that, then we have a better possibility that the whole front of the body has engaged um, appropriately that the four abdominal sheaths are now involved, that the stratus anterior, that the latissimus dorsi is now involved. Where when we jump up in half handstand, yeah. we set the, most of us, we, because that is instinctively reflex, a reflex in the body, it lets the abdominals go, and it lets a lot of these muscles that we really, really need, it lets them go. Yeah. And then like to re reapply them in this moment of going down that's quite advanced but when the knees go straight into the chest then the, it, everything goes whoop, in that time uh, and so how, so how so high would the hips be in that not position? so high not so high let give it a try you know and uh, the more advanced you go the more you can move the uh, up into a half handstand yeah but uh, maybe with a tighter Tuck. You want yeah. to you want to gather the body. You don't want to um, display the body. Like what's it called? The opposite. You don't want to splay it out. Yeah. You don't yeah. splay the body out. That you want to go whoop into a, a small thing instead of a big thing. A big small body instead of a big body. Also, in my soul, uh, Sherrod is not suggesting. It's not being very sympathetic to the whole jump into half handstand and yeah. hold handstand. He, he's not into it at all. I think he's probably seen 200 variations of it that <laughs> doesn't really work. I have, yeah. for sure. Yeah. Even in my yoga shala in Miami, I see yeah. a lot of that. And um, I <clears throat> also think it can create shoulder problems, like it can create the wrong kind of strength in the body, this kind of strength that keeps you that makes you stiff and keeps yeah. you out of your shoulder joints rather than the kind of strength that creates further movement, mobility, movement po potentially yeah. in your shoulder joints. It definitely seems to be, as you say, more difficult to control that weight on the way back down yes. again with a lot of the small muscles around the yeah. shoulder. And if we start with the knees into the chest, yeah. then we start to create the strength that it takes to, uh, to do this. And when we get good at that, we can maybe start to hike it up a little more or, little, or have a little bit higher. The whole floaty thing is, in my opinion, completely overrated. Yeah. You know, floaty happens when you find the right function. It's like foam follows function. Like to try to go for float, oh, uh, Charlotte calls it show off. Yeah. You know, and I think there's a certain amount of, that's the part that mentally, emotionally, spiritually, that we want to kind of keep a little bit in check all the time. That kind of thing where we feel cool, that kind of thing where we feel we're special, yeah. that kind of thing where we start to say, yeah, check me out. You know, <laughs> like when that is starting to go jump on. Through. Yeah. yeah, do the opposite, you know, yeah. do the opposite. That is a, a part of the, what are they called? The Ari Chat Vargas, the six enemies, the six poisons that has to do with desire and pride. Yeah and greed and uh, keep it down a little. Now, I'm not saying that there's not a time where it's it can be appropriate. You know, if you are starting to, if you're at this uh, end of intermediate series and you're starting to work on handstands, then it might be appropriate to start to get that activity in there. But before that, absolutely not. I saw that Matthew Sweeney in Australia, he, yeah. he has a new video out that's called Vinyasas or something like that where yep. he gives a series of suggestions of how to jump through depending on how advanced you are. Yeah. I just think the danger is that everyone wants to do the most fancy from the beginning. Mm, right? Yeah. Everyone wanna be the everyone wanna be the king. Mm. So um, as you say, getting into ego. Yeah. Mm. And as soon as I do it, 
So maybe I let's say I can do that, right? Yeah. So I'm not jumping through like this. Then now you're next to me and you just started yesterday now. You also want to do that. Yeah. So now for the next three years you practice with one thing in mind and that is to do that. Yeah. And that just starts to carry like rings in the water. So yeah. I think there's uh, many ways of practicing. One is to practice for ourselves. This is what I want to accomplish. Another way to practice is this is what I am working on. I would like to do that without creating negative effects around me. So even if I'm working on something that's quite advanced, I want to make sure that I do not create confusion around me. Yeah. That's very important. If not, it's no yoga no more. Yeah. Then I'm working not for the bettering of the world, but confusion in the world. That is not a good idea. <laughs> if we switch tact again yeah. and um, you got me going there. I know, yeah, you're on a run. <laughs> <laughs> you can hear I have, we're, we're, I'm completely opinionated yeah, about this. Yeah, we're going to calm you down now. <laughs> calm you down. Can I say one more thing? <laughs> yeah. I'm not saying I'm right. No. I'm just saying I have an opinion on this. Yeah, yeah which is all. good. This is what, you know, we need, you know, is mm -hmm. opinions. In, yeah. for, to be able to discuss things. Yeah. You know. Um, Pashasana. Yeah. Um, it's often difficult for people to ground that one of the heels mm -hmm. so say we're or turning both. to the or both or yeah. even say we're turning to the left mm -hmm. seems to be the right heel then in that case it is more difficult to get down than the other one mm -hmm. any ideas as to um, what to do what to do well I think a lot of stuff goes into that I think genetics goes into that okay. you know like how short how long are your Achilles tendon yeah how is your uh, maybe even how your uh, ankle joint is built I'm not yeah, sure there can sometimes be some compression at the front of the ankle joint yes yeah and your hip joint you know how tight is your hip joint um, I know some of the most uh, advanced practitioners some of the foremost practitioners like David Swinson he does yeah. not have his heels down yeah. And I don't think it's because he's a bad asana practitioner that that's <laughs> going on. <laughs> so I uh, used to have my heels down. Uh, yeah. Then I had them up for a series of years. And now I'm starting to move them back down again. Uh, the reason my heels came up was because I was dealing with some injury and yeah. stuff like that. But um, uh, I think, so first, and first of all, I think there's that factor. Uh, and Second, I think you do what you can. Like I tend to, when people have their heels off, I ask them to do it two times usually yeah. uh, for a while. First, to roll something up under the heels yes. and as much as they want so they can get the grounding feeling yeah. of this. So they are, are in a less, so we're in a less perchy and tense situation where we cannot move from our sympathy nervous system into a parasympathetic nervous system so first that both sides then having done that then move that away yeah. and now do it one more time with the however you can yeah trying to drop the heels to the ground whether they touch or not mm. does that make sense yeah and then spend a little time uh, every day jump forward sit down in Pashasana Sautta and, yeah. and wait there and just figure out where can you give, where can you stretch. And take a few breaths and just go move into your breath as in move into your parasympathetic nervous system and just chill for a moment. Ooh, then start to reach over and start to get your back muscles stretching and whatever is in the way there. Sometimes I notice that, say, turning to the turning to the left <coughs> and the, the the hips may move out to the mm. to the right mm. and again there can be just some disparity there between the kind of so you have sides. your left heel behind your buttocks type thing. Yeah, yeah yeah do we try to control that movement sideways of the hips I do that yeah is it wrong I don't know um, it creates more pressure on the knee joint because now we have a slight twist in the knee joint a little bit more than when we're sitting in 
in the middle actually a little significant more there yeah. if you have knee problems you might want to be careful with that move if you do not have knee problems it's probably fine to do you that do. no one has ever corrected me yeah is it a cheat i don't know if it is then it's a very common one yeah so uh, uh, i think the next thing we do after that i think is usually that we try to catch our hands that i think is a big mistake yes yeah. i think the next there's a series again of movement that needs to fall into place and in my opinion there's now three binds that needs to happen before we can before we add in the first is that the uh, shoulder to knee bind yeah. then after the elbow to shin bind and finally there's the hand to hand bind the yeah. hand to wrist bind so and i think that most people that i see is uh, that has a problem with this I mean, even some people that doesn't have problem they just instantly try to reach for that instead yeah. of setting up very clearly the first bind with the shoulder to knee and working that whole back where you can really deeply get the twist to get through i've watched freeman do it and he almost sits back and he reaches up like real real high doesn't he and then on an exhale yes. he folds forward yes. is that the sort of thing you you do do you find that useful or how do you approach Sometimes. it Sometimes. I wonder if he does that to demonstrate. Yes. And sometimes yeah. when we see our teachers um, do something in front of us, like yeah. we tend to over make everything o everything over explicit. Yes, to accentuate what he's doing, maybe. Yes, mm. but I think by the end of the day, yeah, that's pretty much what we have to react after lengthening yeah. in that uh, posture from all the way down in our uh, hip joints and our groins. Mm to the whole back of our pelvis, up over our lower back, our upper back, up over our um, teres minor and all this here and getting the whole delta and everything um, rotated around that way before we come around. And then finally giving a little bit of activation down here in the below your shoulder. And do you, do you personally, do you actively engage your obliques to help you twist around? How much of it is is using your arm on, on the outside of your legs and how much of it is actually engaging the rotational forces in your trunk to and bring you around. about the obliques. Sometimes, Kino asked me some questions like that sometimes in the <laughs> middle of practice. And then sometimes I have no idea and I go, she says, do you activate your obliques? I go, <laughs> oh yeah, of course I don't. Of but you know, yeah, something yeah, like that, yeah. right? But I would have to, I would have to Try check it, it out see, next yeah. time, but Pashasana, especially on the right side, I'm yeah. a little tight on the, with the right arm here, yeah. is uh, I'm, I need to pull on whatever I've got. So. <laughs> You've got to get this arm around yeah. there. Uh, yeah. Cool. Left is a little easier. <laughs> uh, I wanted to ask you about Bhujabhidasana, mm -hmm. another stumbling block for quite a few people in, in various stages. Yeah. In the in the early stages of your practice, it's it's challenging just to be able to cross your ankles yeah. and maintain your balance. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then, once you've started moving forward, something I played with, and I, I wanted to try and clear up with you, was how deep to go through before you actually cross your legs. So how far do you work your shoulders through? before you actually cross your feet in front of you. Because it seems to me that the deeper you go through to cross your feet, the, the nicer cross you get. Mm. Uh, the, but then it seems to be harder. The folding forward seems mm. harder. Mm. But then when you come out of it, it's easier to do the transition mm. because your legs are much higher for, for mm. Titibasana to jump back. Yeah. But, but consequently, the other the other arise when it's not quite as tight a bind it's so much easier to fold forward i think that buja bidasana works in such a way that we have it before kurmasana and supta kurmasana yeah so it's the same type of bind but it's a little bit less it's a little more forgiving yeah so whereas for kurmasana supta kurmasana it's absolutely imperative that you have your knees over your shoulders because if not you do not you cannot bend them they get stuck around the shoulder girdle. So I th 
I think that in Pucho Bidasan it's the same idea, just a little bit less little bit of less. that. So I I come around and I'm a little bit lower down. Yeah. And then I think one thing that helps very much is to squeeze the knees a little bit together while I move my shoulders apart. So there's a little bit of torque and tension between these two forces. Yeah. And then catching the feet, the first thing uh, is to if you can come down without putting the feet down yes. first, of course, is to start to squeeze your heels towards your butt. And by doing that, you start to kind of squeeze your knee joint around your upper arm. Yeah. And by doing so, um, the pelvic floor and the lower abdominals and the middle and upper abdominals start to come into play. and the back starts rounding and there's like a lifty rounding sensation that carries you down. Does that make any sense? Yeah, and your feet, are you pointing your feet backwards as well? So they start like that yes. when you cross them and then you point them back and before you come through? First you just pull the heels in. Yeah. Is, and you can even go like this yeah. and you pull the heels in and when that, then the whole thing starts to go like this, you open your feet so they can get through. Yeah. And then you come through and you put your chin down and your head down, whatever you do. And you keep that activation and one more time you get, you make sure that your shoulders is not hanging out up here. <laughs> yep. um, but that you have your shoulder saddle in place. You go yeah. whoop, as much as you can and you push a little into the ground. And then you keep this whole thing lifted until it's time to go. And then you pivot your way back. back and, then yeah. and for those people that are, are having trouble with stage one of mm -hmm. maintaining that balance and not falling backwards yes. when they're first crossing crossing yeah. their legs yeah what needs to be going through their minds as to how can they take their center of gravity forwards yeah I stop them going backwards you know I'm a I'm a great fan of not doing too much too soon mm. so I really believe in uh, creating familiarity with every step so because usually what stands between uh, not being able to do it and being able to do it is impatience, yeah. Yeah, I, I find. Or I ignorance, not being willing to look at it step by step and break it down. So, and having said ignorance, I mean the, I mean avidya, the base condition of uh, the human being, of any uh, existence in uh, seven realms so <laughs> yep, yep. more than just ignorance you know in a normal sense so what i s usually suggest in in this case is just open your feet place them on the floor and just use them go yep. down when you feel com comfortable with that you can start to go down without putting the feet first but do this until you're just take your time sick and tired of it until yeah. you're bored with that and then start to go on to the next thing boredom is usually a really good indicator that the next step is... Yeah, you're ready? Uh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> cool. Um, headstands. Mm -hmm. uh, two things, really. First thing is, um, I've seen some people that are very proficient at headstands, and mm -hmm. so far that they're controlling their, their, their weight, they're stable, mm -hmm. um, there's not much weight on their head, mm -hmm. yet they need that psychological uh, security of the wall. Mm -hmm. So they can be away from the wall and be balancing, but if you then transport them to the center of the room, mm -hmm. psychologically, the really starts everything going. goes. Yeah. yeah, how can they make that transition smoothly? I mean, they've got the they've got all the skills they need to do it. Mm -hmm. So it's only a a mental thing going on. Is there well, is there anything that can be done to if there's a teacher? Mm. That's a great mediary step in between the wall and nothing at all. Yeah. If there's no teacher, then boredom again is a great helper. Um, or just not lift up with straight legs. Just uh, set it all up. Make sure that there's that the shoulder, that the elbows are well grounded, yeah. that the uh, wrist and the uh, the hand is well grounded and active in the ground. Yeah. So the shoulders are not here, but that the whole thing is being thrusted down in into way. the ground. So that's maybe also slightly less weight on the head. And then straightening the legs and starting to walk in. 
and then just staying there like that is a headstand you know that is the full benefit is there now if you want a little more benefit then pivot a little bit more front and you can bend your knees and not bend your knees in that process and then just wait for the time when it don't try to come up but just like pivot it towards the front and just work on a front to back transferring of weight rather than trying to get up so don't don't kick up and then a some moments see if you can bend the knees a little bit so now you bend your knees into your chest and your feet up to your butt and then your sit bones can kind of move up towards the ceiling and you're just there with bent legs and if it feels scary you can always just put your feet back down, back down they're yeah. very close to the ground when you get sick and tired of that then try to move one leg move it back down the other leg see how that feels and usually that movement just makes the mind go yeah, yeah so just get used to that movement when you're used to that movement then maybe try to move it a little bit further up a little bit further up until it's all the way straight and then try with both legs so just slowly 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 like the basic idea is <clears throat> if you can do from a to d in one go yeah. then go from a to c if you can't go from a to c then go from a to b if you can't go from a to b then go halfway to b if you cannot yeah. go halfway to then in that way yeah just cut it down into millimeters break it down use your mind uh, to ana analyze how can i break this down manageable sections manageable sections exactly just keep breaking it down and forget what the final goal is slowly move towards just gentle steps gentle steps and before you know it you can do it you can do it yeah i i, I feel that with my own practice i've seen that uh, with friends and students over and over again so that is the most important how do you approach um <coughs> say you're working on a new posture <coughs> how do you ab approach that do you just repeat it or do you say like okay uh, this posture requires me to have a greater extent of, say, external rotation in the hip than I needed mm -hmm. before. Yeah. Therefore, I'll do some of this, which will then help me achieve. Maybe we don't want to use the word achieve. We yeah. can move forward into mm -hmm. the next posture, mm -hmm. or do you just do it and and wait and and let it happen. If I try to uh, move into new territory, yeah. whether it's a deeper backbend or a new backbend or something like that, the first thing I do is try to get an idea about how the posture should look like. Yeah. And then I try to move myself towards that and figure out where's the obstacles. And then when I st start to f uh, feel those tight spots and those uncomfortable spots and those painful spots or that strength that seems to be lacking i just try to get a, get my head around that a little bit just like not trying it too hard just figuring out what is it that i'm lacking here where is what's in the way in terms of too little strength or too much too little stretch or whatever what's in the way and then i start to chip away at that a little bit more and there's two ways to for instance gain more uh, flexibility or strength for that sake one is to start to do a couple of stretches before your your practice yeah. another is to identify where in the practice these stretches exist already yes and then focus on that when i get there because my new goal my new uh, <coughs> uh, desire yeah. is this new asana so that means that i cannot do so my main problem my main obstacle my main focus in my practice is right now to learn that yeah so then let me learn that in everything else i do before that so if that is learning hanuman asana for instance yes then uh, and the hamstrings are a little bit too tight yeah then we have these wonderful Surnamaskaras in the beginning that I can milk for hamstring stretches yep. to the furthest, furthest extent and all the way like the standing posture is wonderful for the hamstring yeah. in general right if it's the front of my in this in Hanumanasana it's the front of my yep. so leg that goes yep. back yes yeah, so was and, and um, uh, a little bit of called? rectus femoris yeah, yeah. Uh, the quad yeah the, uh, yeah 
the, the, the yeah, quadriceps muscle. Yeah, the, the one that crosses muscle. the hip. Yeah. yeah. If it's some of those muscles mm. there, then there might be some other postures that are effective for that. For instance, the whole beginning of intermediate series is mm. wonderful to uh, get some yes. information in, uh, out of that. So you'd work those a little stronger. Would you repeat anything? Would you stay a little longer? Uh, reinvest focus into them because if I now need like when I learned those let's say I had I have now done intermediate series for a while and now I am learning Hanumanasana which is yeah. towards the end of the third series and so now maybe I can do um, maybe my body is available on that level that I needed in the intermediate series now I need a little bit more that means I need to reinvest back in and find some more stuff in there. I need to go back into that room and figure out what else is here that I can draw upon so Hanumanasana is a little better for me. And the, the, the pose that you're working on, would you repeat that a number of times? How would yeah. you work with that posture? Absolutely, absolutely. Stay longer time, mess around, ruminate inside the asana, figure out what it is, look at you that's right next to me when you do it or the people uh, YouTube yeah. buy a book uh, speak to your best friend who's a massage therapist you know whatever so find out as much as you can about it yeah explore get some information get really confused and then pull it all together in the end and let go of the confusion that's where uh, my soul is wonderful or in general having a teacher if you have a teacher you can ask what am I supposed to do here? Yeah. The teacher might say it with a lot of words or with very few words. And that information, that is what you move towards. And you use whatever you can to get there, in my opinion. I want just one final thing. Uh, we were, I wanted to approach this thing about many of the teachers advise the postures in slightly different ways. And, and it can be confusing maybe for the student to go to one teacher and they say do this, one teacher do, says that. And I know that you were aware that you've said, how about doing this and, and uh, experimenting. Yeah. Um, but is there this, also like a central core, isn't there, of, 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 that draws it all together? Yeah. Um, let me see how this goes. <clears throat> I think in the Sankhya philosophy, there's, they say there's three kinds of truth. There's the truth for one man. It's like, I dream about a unicorn, therefore I say this is reality. Yeah. Um, then there's a truth for everybody, which is uh, like, uh, uh, I s we all know what a bed is, for instance, we agree what a bed is. And then there's universal truth, which is kind of like a divine kind of truth. In terms of the yoga practice and how to approach yoga, I don't think there is such a thing as a divine method. There is a common method. And then there is method that I have personally experienced to work for me and the people I've been around. So, and I think for the new student, it can be con conflicting and confusing sometimes to understand the difference between what is yoga and what is the method towards yoga yeah. and usually and in most cases and of course there are deviations for this but in most cases the teachers will try to teach yoga and the, the teacher will try to move towards yoga with the best means possible to them uh, now that will mean that me and someone else will teach slightly different because we have different experiences, we have different pasts, we have different uh, bodies. We've probably been told slightly different information from our teachers, even if we have the same teacher, even if we both come out of Guruji's uh, uh, embrace. We have heard him say slightly different things, we have picked up on slightly different things, even if he said the same thing. I don't think that's a problem, but it can be... Uh, confusing for the student. An example could be you, you, I come in and work with backbend with you and you yeah. say start from your head. Then I go in and I uh, work backbend with someone else and they say start from your hip. I'm very confused which one is correct. Both are correct. It's just what does this teacher think that you need right now. Yeah. 
and the teacher will usually have a progression that uh, of methodology that will they will take the student through and there's many many ways to roam and i imagine even as a teacher you may use different methodology for different students depending absolutely. on what you see and where they need to place their focus absolutely yeah. absolutely cool. varieties there mm. yeah and you can see it in in uh, in Guruji senior students also, you can see the difference between Lino Mili and Nancy Gilgoff, and Nancy Gilgoff and Eddie Stern, and Eddie yeah. Stern and Tim Miller and Tim Miller and Richard Freeman and Richard Freeman and so forth. Yeah. Like they have found their uh, their own ways of teaching the method and all of these people are very, very fond of Guruji and all of them uh, are working in the tradition of Patapa George of Guruji. All of them are very devoted to this man. Uh, but they have learned from him in different times and in different ways and with different capacities and with different interests. Uh, so you get slightly different things. But it also means that sometimes and most of the time the classic recommendation is to follow one teacher. Yeah. Now it's not that I start yoga today and then I follow only one teacher. It's not possible. I need to practice with some different teachers for a while to figure out what works best for me. At some moment, hopefully in an organic uh, process, we start to narrow down the amount of teachers that we have. And then after a while, hopefully we end up with one teacher. One more thing about that. It can be one teacher, in my opinion, my personal opinion, it can be one teacher that we go to that person and that's our central baseline. Yeah. And then, um, so I go and I, I practice with you, and you are my central baseline. But then I will also go to someone else who has specialized in uh, backbends. Yeah. Work a little bit with that person, then I come back to you, and I see how this fits in, or if it does at all. Um, the only problem is, as soon as we, we do that, we open ourselves up for confusion again. Yeah. Because, but also, each teacher is working, they're interpreting what they've heard in the first place, translating it for their body, and then teaching it as they've seen that it's affected their body as well. So, yes. there's always going to be some variety, isn't there? Because we're yes. all experiencing everything so differently in, in every body. Yes. And so, we can, what was easy for one is more difficult for another, and, yeah. and so there's bound to be that amount of variation yes but um, on that same point of variation uh, I know we talked about this a little bit earlier about maintaining that s that s center core of the practice mm. and not throwing in too many variations mm. as far as different asanas mm. um, that sort of thing yeah it's the same idea like we have this um, golden principle that we call shtita which is stability and steadiness and we basically the main obstacle uh, uh, according to Patanjali one of our main obstacles to yoga is that we do not have carry through we do not have perseverance we do not have we do not have endurance we do not have stability of mind steadiness of mind so <clears throat> we are trying to cultivate steadiness and we are not trying to cultivate multiple inspiration so uh, by the end of the day, what we really, really uh, propagate is steadiness of mind. And we only get that through steadiness of living and steadiness of practice. So if our tendency is that we easily get confused and distracted, which it is for most of us, multifocus, multifocal living, then it is better to s keep it as simple as possible. That is the classic recommendation in yoga. Cool. Thanks so much for talking to us, Tim. It's been like a ton of information. Thank you, Stu. <laughs> it was uh, super interesting. Yeah, cool. Yeah, nice. Thanks very much. All right.